Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend, and today we're doing the quintessential Christmas dessert of the 18th century. Yeah, plum pudding. You've heard of it, and it's going to be great. Thanks for joining us today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. So we don't think too much about plum pudding today, except in these strange literary references. But in the 18th century, it was referenced hundreds and hundreds of times. It's a very, very popular dessert in England and in North America in our time frame. One of the most common references that we are used to is in Dickens's A Christmas Carol. And here's a section. This is Mrs. Cratchit. In a half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered flushed, but smiling proudly with the pudding, like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in a half, a half a quarter of ignited brandy, and bedight with Christmas holly stuck in the top. Yes, uh, plum pudding was a Christmas dessert as well as just a standard dessert that was common, but very, very particularly for Christmas. Now, what does it mean by a plum pudding? What are the plums in a plum pudding? Well, plums aren't the plum from a plum tree, but they are raisins. Here's Dick, uh, Johnson's dictionary from 1809. He says, a plum, it's either a fruit or dried grapes or 100,000 pounds. Well, dried grapes. Uh, are what they mean by plums and a plum pudding. A plum can really just mean some of, sort of anything sweet, and raisins were used as a sweet in the 18th century. So that's the plum in our plum pudding. So I dug through all the cookbooks, and there were many, many recipes. I picked out the one from the London Art of Cookery by Farley because it's the simplest and it's got some good instructions here. A plum pudding boiled. Cut a pound of suet into little pieces, but not too fine. A pound of currants washed clean. A pound of raisins stoned. Eight yolks of eggs and four whites. Half of a nutmeg grated. A teaspoonful of beaten ginger. A pound of flour. And a pint of milk. Beat the eggs first, then put them in half the milk. And beat them together, and by degrees stir in the flour. Then the suet, the spice, the fruit, and as much milk as will mix it well together, very thick. It will take five hours boiling. We're going to take a page out of a couple of other recipes to make this one a bit more festive with a few extra ingredients. We don't want to boil our pudding for five hours, so we're going to make a smaller version. <laughs> we're going to go with a one-third size. So basically six ounces of all the main ingredients, and then we add in the, the spices and whatnot. So let's start off just like the recipe did. I'm not going to do the special thing with the um, eggs because we only have three eggs in this. So rather than do something like... Um, you know, two whole eggs and one yolk. We're just going to put three eggs in there. Let's not complicate it. On a, on a recipe like this, it's not going to make that much difference. So three whole eggs. Our eggs are whisked up. I'm going to add, it says add in half the milk. So we don't want to go crazy with our milk. Uh, we will use that milk, this extra milk later on to bring our consistency up. If, we, if, we, if it's too thick, we can add some of that extra milk and get where we need to go one of our additional ingredients, which you do not have to include. Again, this is very, very additional. Uh, as a Christmas pudding, uh, many of the recipes have a little bit of brandy put in. So I'm gonna go ahead and put in a touch of brandy. So let's start adding some of these ingredients to it. I'm gonna start off with our flour. Again, I'm not gonna add it all at once because I don't want it to get all lumpy. Starting to really thicken up. Let's put our sweetmeats in. And you heard uh, raisins and currants. And the currants in here, there are two kinds of currants. The currants come off of a currant bush, or again, currants are just little tiny raisins. And we're gonna be using those type. That's what's typically meant in these recipes. And I've got, this seems like a lot, doesn't it? Yep, we're gonna put them all in there. Boop. All those currants in there. Now, the raisins, and again, we've got six ounces of raisins along with six ounces of currants. It's a lot of raisins. There we go. 
I'm gonna go ahead and add our spices in now, again, before it gets too thick to mix it well. Half a teaspoon of ginger, powdered ginger, and it called for in that recipe a whole half of a nutmeg. Of course, this is a one-third recipe, so we, we don't need a, a whole half of a nutmeg in this. But, I mean, could you go wrong? Let's start to fold in our suet. Suet is, is one of those special things. To make a proper boiled pudding like this, you've got to have suet. And it's not something that we typically have in our supermarkets here in North America. This is not just regular muscle fat, but it's kidney fat. It's this very, very waxy fat. Um, and it has a very high melting temperature. So what happens here is we put it in and it um, is mixed all throughout this mixture. And as it boils, it liquefies and creates little holes. It gives it a sort of an a fluffy quality, if you can call it that. So in it goes. And it needs to be kind of in little bits. It can't be in these great big blobs. I kind of cut it so that it's, it's very frayable and can uh, break up into our pudding into little pieces all over. Okay, our consistency is still looking really good. It's, um, now, this is a Christmas one, and we can add some extra of colorful sweet meats to it. So I've got some candied orange peel. I'm not gonna have to put a bunch of that in there. We've got plenty of sweets in here already. Um, there's some candied lemon peel. And if you want something very, very colorful in there, something like candied cherries. Again, they had all these sort of sweet meats in the time period, and it would be something that went into a fancy pudding. So we've got a nice homogenous mix here. Uh, and the consistency is pretty thick, but I'm gonna continue to add just a little bit of flour until it gets a bit more thick. And really the issue has to do with as that boils, you don't want the individual components, especially the raisins, to all sink down to the bottom and then it won't look right. It needs to be, uh, the consistency needs to be over the whole piece. So we need it to be, that's why they call for a, uh, a stiff uh, mixture when it's done. This mix is perfect right now. It's very colorful and it smells great. It's gonna go in and I can't wait to see how it's gonna look when it comes out. Now it's time to get it ready to go into the pudding cloth. So our pudding cloth is an essential piece of equipment in making this particular dish and we have to prepare it. We have to get it ready. And so what we're going to do is take our pudding cloth. Now, when I say a pudding cloth, I mean a finely woven, fairly thin piece of cloth like muslin, not cheesecloth. That will not work. Don't use cheesecloth. We're going to take a nice piece here. This is 18 inches square. I'm gonna dunk it in my boiling water just for a second and then take it out. And now we're gonna set it out in this fairly large bowl and flour that. So we're gonna spread flour all over the interior of that. That'll help the pudding stay together and not seep through the pores of the cloth. That's why we don't wanna use cheesecloth because the pudding will just basically dissolve right through the cheesecloth. So don't use that. And then we bring this up semi-tight and tie it off with a string. We want it to be uh, a fairly strong string. We don't want that to break. Now this will probably grow a little bit as it boils, it'll get tight, but that will make a nice round shape and that's what we're looking for. We don't want it so tight though that it bursts its cloth. We t they, there are people talking about that in the 18th century. Oh no, my pudding cloth burst and it ruined my pudding. We don't want that. And once that's all tied up, it's ready to go into our boiling water. Now this one won't have to take five hours. This one, this third size, about two and a half hours. So it's boiling away. You wanna make sure the water's boiling the whole time. Now I did a bunch of research on this particular dish because it's just so important. And I found it very, very interesting that it shows up over the entire social spectrum. This is a description from a poor, about a poor house in 1724 in England. It goes through the house and the people that are in it and the work that they have to do and also their entire diet. It has the whole menu here. But at the end of this menu, it says, bread and beer were allowed to all without limitation. They have roast beef at the three great festivals and plum pudding at 
Christmas. So even in the poor house, the poorest of the poor here are being fed plum pudding at Christmas. So here it is on the poorest table possible. And yet, in 1711, we have William Byrd III's diary, and he's in Virginia, and he writes about having plum pudding for dessert. He has puddings all the time. And this is a very, very well-to-do man. And he's having puddings, a very, very common dish, even in Virginia in the early 18th century. Now, what about other situations? Say Revolutionary War, uh, Revolutionary War America. There's a great reading from uh, Thomas Anbury's journal, and he talks about traveling as a prisoner of war officer in 1778. And he's staying in different kind of houses as they travel from one spot to another. And here he's talking about his host. He says, he has engaged for some time past among his friends and relations. He would stay at home and entertain us an excellent Christmas dinner, not even forgetting the plum pudding. So here is Revolutionary War America, and there's somebody having a Christmas dinner, and there it is, plum pudding all over again, showing up all over these amazing places, and not just in uh, the 18th century, but in the 19th century, like uh, the Christmas Carol, or even before that. A voyage to Virginia. 1649. The feast of Christmas came upon us, which we began with a very melancholy solemnity. And yet to make some distinction of the times, the scrapings of the meal tubs were all massed together to compose a pudding, malaga sack, sea water, with fruit and spice, all well fried in oil were the ingredients of this regale, which raised some envy in the spectators, but allowing some privilege to the captain's mess. We met no obstruction, but did peaceably enjoy our Christmas pudding. 1649. Even aboard ship when they had no rations left on Christmas, they tried to put together a Christmas Pudding. That's how important this particular dish is to this time of year. This one's ready to eat. Let's just see how it turned out. Now, I put a pudding sauce on top of this. Many of the recipes call for a simple pudding sauce, butter, butter, sugar, wine, or something like this, butter, sugar, and brandy. The wine turns out great, or just plain butter and sugar. It's got so many different interesting flavors going on in this. You know, the raisins and the raisins for their sweetness. But raisins bring in a lot more flavor than just sugar, which we might, you know, use today. It's got a lot of savoriness to it also. Um, all that all that suet, while it you might think, yuck, you know, that's got this weird, you know, fat flavor to it. It doesn't. It brings in this wonderful savoriness to this along with the sweetness. So it's a it's a real complex kind of dessert compared to what kind of we're used to today. Just, you know, sugar on top and nothing else. So there's a whole bunch to this. And we get to choose also as we make our pudding sauce as to just how sweet this gets. We can make it a, a real sugary uh, sauce and we can use a lot of it. Or we can make it a very buttery sauce with just a little bit of sugar. And wow, it really brings, brings out all these flavors and we get all this sweetness and it's very moist, very, very moist. It's really something that should come back into popularity because it is just so good and so Christmas. If you have never had a boiled pudding before, and this is a not the easiest technique in the world, 
but it really is something you need to try out. And this is the perfect time of year for it. When we need to take a little extra time for the holidays, we need to take extra time cooking a special dish. This is one of those things. It is so quintessentially Christmas and it is the perfect thing for you to try out this time of year. I hope you have a very Merry Christmas and thanks for watching.